bearded bow man. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to an all new episode of the bearded bio man. I'm your host chase. And as always on the show, we got to bring on some biomeds that I've just been waiting to talk to. Today, I'm joined by Monty and Bill from the CBET. If you don't know what that is, this is the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. And I'm really looking forward to getting into the conversation today and just obviously talk biomed shop, but really want to hear what you guys are doing at the school because, you know, I'm really appreciative of enriching and, you know, building up the next generation for the HTM field. So welcome, gentlemen. And Monty, if you want to get started, just let people know a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll take it from there. Sure. Well, we're excited to be on and uh, talking with you today. Um, we're just uh, overwhelmed and excited with the uh, success that we've seen you achieve uh, with your podcast. And, uh <clears throat> You know, applaud your efforts to, to spread the word and do good work for the industry and really elevate the game. Uh, my name is Monte Gonzalez. I'm the uh, president of the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. Um, I've been at that job now for about four years uh, with my good friend and colleague, Mr. Bill Bassick. Hi, my name is Bill Bassick, and uh, I'm the founder of the College of Biomedical Equipment Technology. And we've been doing this now since 2017. When it was accredited, got it reaccredited in 2019. My background is that um, I started off as a medical technologist and from there went into field service working on uh, hematology and coag analyzers with Coulter uh, Electronics, who was later bought by Beckman Coulter. Um, before, after that, I got trained in chemistry, microbiology, and various other specialized life science devices. Ended up working for Four Core Master Plan when I was through with that. And then um, GE, and then after GE, ended up with um, Barnes Jewish Hospital in St. Louis, where I learned about uh, HTM. I knew nothing about the responsibilities of a biomedical technician at that time, uh, nor was I qualified to have the job that I was hired for in St. Louis. Um, it was one of those deals where uh, I was liked from having a good personality, you know, being able to um, do conflict resolution, and they couldn't keep any managers at that hospital. And that's when I learned. Uh, everything I know now about uh, biomedical as far as management is concerned. Um, after that, the only thing I needed to learn was how to price. So I ended up working for a company called Patriot Medical. And from there, they Sodexo bought them out. And that's when I quit and started my own service company up. And I found it hard in Texas to find qualified people that, that work for my company, you know, as far as new people, you know, tech one. So that's when I got the idea to build a school. And uh, one thing led to another, and I did have a brick and mortar school, but uh, due to circumstances, I had to shut that down and sell it and then uh, reacquired it back in 2017 to be able to meet Monty and uh, one of his good friends, Mr. Scott McKnight. And uh, they helped me for one year and didn't require any pay or anything to get this school off the ground and to where it's at now. And it was a major challenge at that time. And we built it at a time where no one really believed in the online school. They didn't share the vision, which was fine because if they did, then everybody would have an online school. But the good thing is, is we don't get upset about that because now we're able to educate and teach people, do the paradigm shifts and um, be able to introduce all this new cool stuff ready to do. Oh, it's a very interesting journey that you've had. You, you kind of you kind of hit every part of the industry almost. I don't, I don't think people realize the amount of money, effort, and just the logistics of running a biomed program. I mean, I went through the Army program when it was still over at Shepard Air Force Base before you know went down to San Antonio the types of equipment, maintaining the equipment, the, the training materials, and then obviously, you know, making sure that all the students are prepped and the, the testing and everything that goes into it. There's, I, I would love to just, you know, have y'all, if you wouldn't mind just going into like some of the details a little bit about like, what does it take to keep a biomed program running such as yours? 
you know, because I, I want people to appreciate and see just all the blood, sweat, tears, and obviously everything that you guys have put into this. Because what you have built from, you know, the the brick and mortar to what it is today is obviously sought after and recognized already within our industry, and people appreciate what you guys have put together. Yep, <clears throat> I'll take the lead on answering. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, it's, uh, it's been an interesting journey for us, for sure. When we started out um, in, in 2017, as Bill said, um, we literally started the college with three plastic boxes full of files and uh, needed to figure out which direction to go. And um, what's, what's made us successful truly is the people we've surrounded ourselves by. Um, our core instructional team consists of people that look a lot like you, Chase. They're probably 75% of them are uh, military trained biomeds um, that have that really rich, deep experience in training. Um, and the rest of our instructional staff includes um, really seasoned professionals, guys and girls that are out there serving as you know, directors you know, direct, you know, of clinical engineering departments, people with 30 to 40 years of imaging experience and background and just really rich, you know, experienced and profiles. And, and that's been the hallmark of who we hire and who we've surrounded ourselves with. And the people that we've brought, up, brought onto the team have done nothing but add value and enrich the program and um, kept it current, as you alluded to, keeping a program current and, and relevant uh, requires a tremendous amount of work and effort. Um, one of the things that uh, really distinguishes us and separates us from other you know, other opportunities that are out there is the fact that we stay as close as we can to our industry partners. We're, we, I meet with industry every single day. I'm speaking to a different company, um, you know, a different colleague out in the field, and we're talking about what's relevant, what's needed, what's necessary. And, and seeking strong relationships. You know, we are, we act as a uh, um, sort of a, you know, we want, we want to be the educational center mass and um, want to provide, you know, really high quality content and service. And we want, to, we want to graduate technicians from our program that the industry can trust when they hire, know what they're doing. Um, you know, there's, there's always a little bit of sweat equity involved when you hire a brand new. Uh, technician, you got you got to you got to mentor them and guide them and try. And them. rightly so, there has to be. <laughs> yeah, it's part of the game. But to the extent that the industry that hires our technicians understands the amount of effort and work that we put into preparing them, that's really important to us. And uh, that, that's how I lead into that question in terms of you know how it's it's a huge investment. Um, we it's funny in some of our courses we have we put two instructors in some courses. Um, so, you know, we're in some ways doubling our expense, but it's worth it because sometimes that interchange and communication between two people equally qualified that see things a little bit differently, it just makes the learning experience that much better. Um, so it's, it's been a challenge. It's been a great challenge. It's been a huge investment, but it's, it's paying off. We're, I think uh, this year we'll probably graduate somewhere between 250 and 300 technicians across the nation. That's incredible. Yeah. And those technicians are going to go to work. Congrats. Really great companies. You know, just really just. Um, you, you, you earned this. Let me. That's incredible. Uh, that's oh, good. We, Thanks. There, Thanks. Please. It's, it's hard. It's hard to do a biomed program. Um, I, I saw this going to David Brodingham's college. He has over, you know, up, you know, in my area, it, it it's a lot of effort and you have to have a passion for it. That speaks multitudes, though, that you have such, you know, seasoned, uh, dedicated and just, you know, overall people that want to give back to the field that those are the people that are teaching the future generation coming out of your school. And, you know, that that's what we need. We need. And I, I I agree with, you know, while the expense may be more having two technicians, you know, you, you have to look at it from the aspect is everybody learns a little differently. Also, like you said, the instructors are going to see 
issues or perhaps know how to reach a particular student maybe a little bit differently. Uh, maybe wording how to voice a particular repair or, you know, have the insight that you could share and disseminate across your students. That's invaluable. And I would assume that also plays a big part in, you know, the, the learning structure as well as what the students get back from it. Um, just out of curiosity, like what, what's your graduation rate? Um, our graduation rate is somewhere between 85 and 90 percent. Um, you know, like most educational programs and institutions, you're always going to have some that start and then for whatever reason, um, they can't complete. Either they've had a career change or, you know, some life event, um, especially through the past two and a half years with COVID. There's been a lot of life events, but our, our graduation rate, rate is very high. Um, <clears throat> and our placement rate is really good. Um, our placement rates are above, um, shoot, I can't remember the last percentages that we had, somewhere around 75 to 80% placed within um, three, uh, three to four months of graduation. Um, so we don't have any problem placing our I mean, that, that says a lot. It's it's hard for Obama to find jobs. Yeah. And well, I mean, uh, which is kind of, it's kind of odd. Yeah, you know, we, you look, we, we have a labor at, issue. If, if you're looking at um, return on investment and you're a student out there looking for a career path and you're not quite sure what you want to do, you know, you can go spend $100,000 on a four-year degree and not get a job. Check for pulse. You okay, Bill? <laughs> Check for pulse. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> hey, I've been five. looking forward to using that button. You just set me up. Appreciate it. <laughs> you, you can spend $100,000 on a four-year degree and then not get a job. You know, um, we, we've kept our, we, we have not adjusted the pricing of our program in quite a few years and um, purposely so because we want students to value the program and what we can offer and we want to put students to work. And if you keep it at a price point where they can afford to go to school, it makes sense for them. And uh, if they know that they can, they can complete a program in 15 months and go get a job that pays a decent living wage. Uh, with a great career path in front of them, that's a that's an extraordinary opportunity. Well, the, the the biomed in general has to value education. Our field warrants and almost requires that we always have to be continuing improving ourselves. Whether that's going and getting manufacturer training, maybe going and getting your bachelor's or master's degree, going and getting certifications through the ACI program. We're always having to adapt, learn, and just keep piling on on our expertise because the field requires that. So I, I completely understand that you guys have to, you know, have a certain price point because the person coming in, you know, they have to value that. And after they complete your program, their education doesn't stop there. Right. I, I don't care what biomeds out there, your education should not be stopping there. Yeah, your your academic and your career paths need to align, and um, it's critically important that they understand that when they walk across the finish line, graduate program, they always need to be looking at what's next. You know, depending if they're going to work, you know, whatever role they they assume when they graduate, they've always got to be looking at what's next. Do they want to go into imaging? You know, do they do they want to get into management? You know, there, there's some out there that just want to stay a bench tech for the rest of their career, and they're very happy working in that world. But even there, things are always changing. Technology is updating. Uh, you know, new equipment, new devices, new, new this and that. So, yeah, absolutely. We, you know, continuing education is just part of the deal. And, you know, especially with this career field, um, the work that you do is life-saving work. You're touching patients, affecting patients' lives, and there's liability involved, and there's you know, patient care involved in it. and what you do. I think the, it, it's, it's, it's been good. I think over the last couple of years, there's been a lot more recognition, I think, and value placed on the role of a biomedical technician. Um, but yeah, I think absolutely right, Chase, that that is an important factor in continuing education as a component of that. I think a lot of organizations are seeing that as well. And I've noticed that many of them are investing more in sort of tuition reimbursement opportunities and things like that. For the workforce, yes, um, and that's been good. That's a good sign of you know recognition for the for this field. Yeah, and also, I mean that 
the the students coming in when you're looking for a company or maybe a hospital system to go work for that's one of the things to look at do they value you know building you up as a technician or are they just want you to come in to facilitate a singular need mm -hmm. because that's not that's not organically healthy as you know for an organization to not invest in the people that they bring on so um it, it's good that you guys are instilling that in them uh one thing that I like the caveat of what you brought up too with, you know, the change in technology. Um, Bill, I, I, I loved getting to go through everything with you at Amy and I'm sure, you know, a lot of people have listened to the prior episode when we go into virtual reality. Um, I'm really appreciative and almost in awe of like the, what you guys have set up through obviously virtual reality, but you know, 3d modeling as well for teaching your students. Uh, what's the process been like for implementing that? And then where do you see it going in the future? Well, the process is still in its infancy stages right now, but we're looking at a few different options right now. One, we're speaking with a few OEMs. We're um, trying to get their interest level raised so they can see at it and, and uh, support us on the development of the new technology coming out with VR development. And uh, there is an interest peak right now. So, Right now, we're at the, the phase where we have to decide which are priorities we want to do. You know, my goal for the school is to get the 20 medical devices so when the students go to school, they actually do the VR training. And if they don't want the Oculuses, they can do it through 3D on the computer itself. Um, and then there's the other option we have that's for strategic is for um, having the OEMs assist us with the development or ISOs as well, and then being able to license that software to other entities that want it, you know, they want to rent it if they have to learn how to work on a portable or any type of medical device. So our, our goal, our long-term goal is to establish a large library of various different medical devices to repair. And on some of them, the larger devices like CT, not necessarily how to repair the entire CT, but how to uh, repair a process that maybe they haven't done in quite a while and they need a refreshers course in 20 minutes. So that's, that's the long-term goal that we're looking at right now. If I can, well, that, that gives you all another avenue, too. If I can add. It's not. This, add, you're, you're, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Monty. No, go ahead. I was just going to say, Chase, that, um, you know, three years ago, Bill said, you know, was, I got to give him credit. It was his idea. He's like, we got to get VR. We got to incorporate VR somehow and, and, and think about how we can do this. And, you know, if we're talking about the investment in education being expensive and a huge resource requirement, the investment in VR is even bigger. Um it is such a complex, technically challenging thing to do that you can't get it wrong. You have to get it scoped out and do it right the first time. So, you know, we it took us a couple of years to get our heads around how to do it. It took us a little bit longer, too, to assemble the right team to be able to do it um, with the right skill sets and the same passion and the vision to get it done. Now we're there. We have that. We have the team and we have the vision and we have the plan and we have the resources and we're doing it. So, you know, like what we what we demonstrated at the Emmy Exchange is really the tip of the spear. Um, where we see it going um, in terms of operationalizing those good ideas, that now is the next challenge. So, you know, our our view is that education is changing rapidly. Um, on a philosophical side, you know, we're in an exponential era where technology is advancing things so rapidly it's hard to keep up and see around the corner. We believe that VR is looking around the corner and that's what's next and education is going to change and follow that path. So on a practical side now, once we develop that VR content, we're going to do exactly what you were alluding to, Chase, which is how do you, then how do you integrate that into programs and training and education? Well, we're, we're figuring that out, but how we're doing it is not by looking internally. We're looking outward to a partnership. So, you know, we worked with uh, Steve Mall, um, at Mall Biomedical, for example. We said, okay, let's, let's, pilot our med right injector training with Steve and let's see if we can make it work. And he already has such a like rich history of training built with the injectors. I mean, you, even my company and several others, when you want to get injector training, you go to mall bomb it. Like that's just, yeah, and Steve, he, right. he has it. So why not tap on somebody that's doing, don't reinvent the wheel. He's, he's great. Steve's great. And, and for us, it's like, if we could convince Steve that our product was viable and our approach was viable, well, now we have a guy who's recognized really as an industry standard bearer telling, telling the community, 
this works and this process works and look, we just did it. So that was really exciting for us to to do that and that partnership meant a lot to us. And, you know, so we, you know, that, that was a huge success and a huge win for our team. Um, and we're going to be doing more work like that with, with Steve in the future, even though he's an Air Force guy. Um, I, I'm, as an Army guy, I'm <laughs> looking at uh, So, uh, he, you know, it's just, it's just fantastic approach. And then looking at um, other opportunities, we're doing the same thing. So we partnered with uh, Medical Imaging Solutions uh, about a year and a half ago to form the Imaging Academy which is an extension of our college and with the imaging academy, we're taking, we're taking the good work that we've done in the biomed world and they're taking it into the imaging world. And so we've developed some really high end training content to build into the imaging academy courses. And the same thing, you probably, you saw the, uh, the tube replacement, um, very technical, you know, high end uh, types of training. And, and so our approach, one of the questions you asked about was how, you know, how do we design or how, how are we determining our approach? How are we you know, going after this stuff? And really what we said is if, if the training is um, really expensive, if it's really dangerous, or if it's just hard to access, then, that, then those are really the three qualifiers for possible VR content development. So in the imaging world, there's plenty of examples of that. So we want to identify really high-end technically complex, difficult to, to deliver training and build that into VR so that it makes sense. Um, if it's stuff that you can train in your shop at the hospital, there's, you know, you really don't need VR around that because you can do it right there. But it's that, it's that specialized, customized training that, that is either unaccessible, too dangerous, or too expensive to deliver otherwise. Um, so right. there's you know, all of those thoughts, and I'm just kind of thinking out loud here, but that's really been our approach. I'd also like to say if there's any philanthropist out there listening, uh, please look us up at cbet.edu. With your technology and the, your mindset, you know, a lot of biomed programs is primarily geared towards getting a BMET-1 out in the world. And, you know, I've had several conversations with other people in our industry, like, what is our definition of a biomed one, because it seems everybody has a little bit of different interpretation. I mean, even if you look at the biomed career ladders within companies, we all have different monikers, different names, different expectations for what each level of a biomed is. And I know there's been discussion of like what the standardization is, but what is, um, I guess, your philosophy and kind of your approach to what a biomed one should be capable of doing after they leave the CBET program? Money, let me answer that first and then you elaborate on it. Um, because I have the service company as well, and I've been doing a lot of research as well as Monty, along with a, a quite a few other organizations because we all try to determine that answer. One of the things I've realized is different companies, you know, whether ISO or OEMs, have different structures or different needs that they need for their biomed one. Therefore, that's the reason why their job descriptions may be different or their names may be different. But in essence, the foundation is all the same across the board. You know, to, to be a biomed, you need these classes here, you know, to get your basic foundation classes. And then from there, you need your specialized training. Well, we're fortunate at CBET that we linked in with a few companies, ISOs, where we're developing that training form. So they hire their biomed one, but they realize they want that technician to have more specialized training in whatever area. So this is what we're doing through CBET to help them get their biomed within six weeks to three months to a different level. There may still be a biomed one, but now it's a biomed one for the way that they want that technician. And then versus a two or three, we're not quite there yet or have established that yet right now, but for the one we have, um, no, I, I think that's a really good question, Chase, and I do agree with Bill. It's not a one-size-fits-all answer. Um, we've worked with a lot of different organizations, and, you know, most of them do not have that answer dialed in yet. Um, I, I, um, I think it was a, It's a quandary of the yeah, field. Yeah, you know, so, you know, Amy's done some good work on that. And, you know, Al Bresch did a really wonderful job his handbook that he created. Um, I'm, I'm not sure there's a one size fits all, you know, from an educational perspective, um, we can, 
we can design a program that meets, I think, 95% of the industry's expectations with what a technician should look like when they come out of school. Um, you know, formalizing a, a career pathing model that includes very specific job descriptions that everyone agrees to might be an impossible task. I think you have to make some generalizations. Uh, <laughs> well, that that's why I tailored the question like I did, because I knew it's, you know, I completely agree. The way to design that is it's not one size fits all because a biomed one going into an ISO field organization compared to one going into an in-house bio, you know, a uh, biomed program versus one going to start off as an OEM uh, technician, they're all going to be doing different things, but the foundation is always the same. And I just thought that was kind of interesting just because it's one of those things that gets brought up a lot whenever you get biomeds in a room together. So I, I appreciate that you guys recognize that. And obviously, you know, this goes to for in-house OEM or even ISOs, it, it benefits them to reach out to your program so that they can get something almost tailor made that's going to benefit their organization the best. I mean, what what other training programs out there can say they, they can do that or have that ability to facilitate that need for that company? That's one a lot. The, one of the projects we've been working on for the past two years is a, a software called SkillNet. And um, it's really a fantastic software. What we've done is work with about three or four different organizations from sort of different flavors, uh, healthcare organization, you know, traditional hospital, um, a couple of ISOs out there, and um, went through their sort of skill database um, for their job requisitions, you know, for the different levels. And then we, we sort of homogenized all of that into, into one big framework. And um, utilizing SkillNet, um, you can really sort of customize your job uh, descriptions within an organization and deploy that software um, to sort of better encompass and more specifically and accurately identify the requirements that are needed for your company. Um, it's really a big, it's a huge database and repository of possible skills and requirements that one might need. Um, it's a great, I'm doing a terrible job explaining it, but it's a great tool, an easy to use tool. Um, and when we set off to design that, we actually were building it um, as part of a, part of our educational program initially um, to help uh, assess a student's start point on day one and then curate an academic pathway that was very customized to their, their needs. So it's sort of a barometer and it's like, if he needs more of this, then we have curated, curated academic pathways that can either give them additional training in electronics or networking or cybersecurity or you know, whatever the case may be. Um, that, that grew substantially to the point where now we're utilize, utilizing that as more of a lead assessment tool. So when we're working with some of the other companies out there, um, we use that to assess the workforce, assess where their technicians are at in particular areas and then develop curated, customized training for them. Um, one, of our, one of our biggest successes so far is working with Sodexo. Um, so Sodexo and our team are working together on a um, really a, sort of a, a mongoloid of a course. It's, it's, uh, it's medical device integration, it's cybersecurity, it's networking, it's IT, it's all of that bundled into a, a six-week course. Um, but what we did was did an assessment of their entire fleet of technicians and then curated that content, and then we're putting those technicians to this course six weeks at a time um, to sort of upskill and uptrain the technicians to deal with you know, that that Goliath of a problem that the entire healthcare industry is dealing with right now. And that's the medical device integration, cybersecurity, IT related issues. Um, that's a right. It's it's a trend. The way the the it's the way everything's going. So why not have that built into there? But also, too, you have it set up to where you can have a biomed that's been in the field and go take these courses and get set up for success. You know, it's not just a biomed one solution. You guys have stuff tailored to where, you know, you can really enrich yourself as a maybe a two or three or a specialty tech, especially once you guys start getting, you know, even the VR set up and, you know, all the specialty modalities with the partnerships from the OEMs. There's, there's a lot of value here that's, 
you know, just going to continue to add to the field. So it's not just, I don't want people to listen to this and be like, well, it's not relevant to me because I'm already in the field. No, you guys have stuff that people can tap into and really add to the resume. You know, if you're a seasoned technician out there, probably where we add tremendous value is, you know, if you want to get into imaging, we have, you know, fully accredited imaging training programs that can really help people expand their careers and get into a different area of expertise and sort of you know, specialty. Um, this fall, we're at, actually launching a, a bachelor's degree, a four-year HTM degree. Um, so if, if, you know, if you have an associate degree in biomedical equipment technology and you want to push that into an HTM degree, then we'll have a four-year HTM degree launched. Um, we have a partnership with um, Central Western uh, University uh, I'm sorry, Central Washington University, and um, they're going to actually have a graduate degree level program that nests with ours. So we've got, you know, we've got really big ambitions to grow our educational programming so that, you know, again, that career path and academic path for a technician in the field um, can can continue propelling them all the way forward and all the way through to whatever, you know, whatever their ambitions or goals happen to be. Um, but back to your point, Chase, we're a hundred percent believers in continuing education and training. And if not with us, with someone, you know, get, you know, you've got to keep moving, moving the needle. Yeah. We, we have a couple other uh, programs that will be coming to in the beginning of the year. We're going to have the master series management class. It's uh, going to be um, either six to eight classes that Al Gresh is going to be teaching. He's in the process of developing that right now with us. So we have, we hire the best in the industry to help us educate. It's not just, subpar individuals they are the top of their field so that's going to be a great class i believe it'll have as much uh, credentialing as the chtm exam um we also have the the dnb for compliance the chop a the chop c or b i'm sorry entry the chop e which is um you know it's advanced basic and then um goes into the administrative side for compliance and whether it's joint commission or the dnb um compliance is compliance and it really helps a biomed technician or htm professional understand his job at a much higher level than usual. Especially critical as we move forward, especially getting into accreditation. I mean, when you, when you get into the field at one point in time, you're going to experience having to work with, or, you know, work around the expectations of joint commission D and V. I mean, the hospitals get their money through accreditation. So what, what does the biobed facilitate? We make sure that they're in the standing and making everybody happy. So you have to be able to have some sort of knowledge, some kind of uh, baseline for that. I want to get into, because besides, obviously, you're, you're, you are a college program, which entails you guys also speak to a lot of, I assume, high school students. One of the bases that we want to do is to build awareness within the field, let people know we're here, we've been here, and we're going to continue to grow. And this is a really enriching and fun field to be a part of. When you guys go out and speak to these uh, these students, I'm curious, like, what is the, what are some of the things that people get as confused with, or maybe you know, just anything that the students come up and tell you, like, what what's the the barometer, what's the breadth of what people take after you speak to them as so well? I, I got a couple of things on that. So first off, <clears throat> about a month and a half ago. I went to uh, Nashville, Tennessee for the uh, International HOSA Conference. And I don't know if you know what HOSA is, but HOSA is an international Mm -hmm. youth healthcare organization um, that now has a new name that HOSA doesn't actually apply to. So the acronym is no longer relevant. Um, And I can't remember what the new name is, but they still call themselves HOSA. But they they support um, the fostering of interest among youth, secondary and below, globally to propel them and, and encourage them into healthcare careers and fields. Great organization. Um, so I was invited to go to the organization a couple months ago. 15,000 high school students there um, in Nashville at one location at one time. Um, now, they did give me COVID, which I recovered from, fortunately. But aside from that... <laughs> Everybody's you getting can't it, man. <laughs> Yeah, I had it two weeks ago. 15,000 kids and not get COVID. I'll just put that out there. Um, <clears throat> so great organization, great event. <clears throat> no one no one there, none of the adults, none of the healthcare industry professionals, experts, 
Um, none of the kids have any familiarity whatsoever with what a biomedical equipment technician is. Um, the biggest thing they confused it with would have been a biomedical engineer um, and, and some other mm -hmm. loosely attached, you know, um, career paths. So our work with HOSA is really focused on, let's take that organization that has 220,000 high school kids in it and let's get them to um, really start to endorse and encourage kids to think about careers with biomedical equipment technicians. Um, they love that idea. So we're going to be meeting with them um, again over the next six to nine months and starting to share and form a, you know, a stronger partnership and relationship with many of the state organizations as well as nationally. Um, yeah, That's it's, so it's a awesome. great way to get our foot in front of that. So that's a tremendous opportunity. And Chase, just so you know, that might be a good future podcast for you as well, because the biggest um, state host of organizations right here in Texas, um, actually in their headquarters is in Dallas. So even easier for you. Um, and I'll put you in touch with that guy, but that's a great organization that would really want to champion okay. biomedical, um, that world into the youth program. Um, so we're doing that. We, earlier in the year, we had, um, we worked with a North Side Independent School District right here in San Antonio, which is the largest school district, and they have a healthcare careers college and a biomedical engineering program. So we sponsored a handful of their kids and actually had them at our school for about three to four months, um, helping us do the VR development. Uh, so we actually had kids working VR development, uh, writing storylines, and doing amazing work um, to further sponsor these kids. Um, and then lastly, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out the good work that uh, Danielle uh, McGurry has done at Amy with sort of the um, HTM in a box and getting the word out and the messaging and, you know, champion in the apprenticeship programs nationally and all that. There's, they're just tremendous opportunity. We're just, we have, we're just barely, you know, we're, we're barely touching on what we can do. Um, drop, it's a drop in the pond, yeah. but as we build on it, it'll yeah, just grow and grow. Uh, running as fast as we can towards that though, because it's a great area to focus and, and I, I actually love youth education as well. It's kind of a passion project of mine. So um, the more we can do there, the better. Monty was an ROTC high school instructor when I met him before he worked for the college. Really? Okay. We met on the right <laughs> board. How'd you like uh, that? Yeah. We, yeah. I spent 10 years as a JROTC instructor after I retired from the army and uh, absolutely loved it. Um, and I'm, the only thing I've loved more than that is doing what I'm doing now. Uh, this is this is a great industry, and I, I love the work I do. But yeah, definitely um, youth education and those opportunities, and you kind of picking out the best of the brightest and encouraging them into career paths, um, and then that reward, seeing them succeed and build out a career path, and you know they might contact you three or four years later and say, "Look, I did it. I'm here." Um, that's amazing. Yeah. There you go. No, it, it's cool to go back to that and be like, hey, you made me, I'm doing well. And that that's that's really rewarding for somebody that puts in the effort in the, you know, getting them to where they are, to where they are today and looking it's back amazing. on it. It's really I had, cool. Um, one of my uh, former um, students at, slash soldiers was a, uh, the last time I saw him, he was a specialist in the Army. And he contacted me the other day. He's a lieutenant colonel in the Texas National Guard. And, uh, you know, it's, you're like, how the heck did that happen? But uh, <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> you you never know where you're going to end up. I mean, five, ten years from where, you know, your biomed journey starts and just, you know, in general in life, like, it's kind of interesting. You you have a plan. You have a vision for yourself. And then all of a sudden you look back and you're like, I had no idea I would no, be you're, here. You're today. right. And this is such an interesting industry because there are so many really great people out there who did not start their careers as a biomedical equipment technician. Um, you know, some of your colleagues that are in the podcast world, like Cheryl, you know, she was a police officer, you know, she's a great yeah. lady. Talk about a great champion for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, just constantly out there doing good work and, and um, you know, just totally different background and experience and stumbled into this industry and is now, you know, one of the biggest voices and champions of the stuff that you, know, that you guys do every day. 
um, yourself, uh, you know, Brian. No, it's it's really neat. We ha- we have like a little yeah. community going. We got the HTM Insider podcast. We got Brian's uh, yep. HTM on the line. Horse Spirit of Biomed. We got Justin doing the Better Biomed YouTube channel. I mean, the, there's it's kind of cool. We're starting to build a media infrastructure, of, you know, other media. But you know, it, it's interesting. I'm looking forward to seeing what it ends up becoming when you look back yeah. ten years from now. I never thought I'd be doing this, but you know. Here I am. <laughs> so, yeah, absolutely. You have to be passionate about this kind of stuff. I, I'm going to continue to do it, and you know, let's see if we uplift and uh, make make the field better. That's the whole. You know, one of the things someone told me is leave the campsite better yeah, than where you 100%. found it. I'm excited that uh, you know, we've we've gotten you guys on here. It's kind of been a uh, a scheduling thing, just. As always, with everybody, you know, biomeds are busy. We got we got things to do. Um, I always like to end off the show with just some fun things that I've came up with that are a little bit nerdy, a little bit quirky, because that's that's me in a nutshell. So, um, invite you guys to play a couple games and a couple questions here. And there will be full disclosure, fun. Chase. I don't have a biomed background. I'm a knuckle dragging. Oh, that's yeah, fine. It, it won't be too difficult. Major that um, stumbled into the healthcare career field. Um, so don't challenge me with uh, too difficult a question. <laughs> oh, don't worry. <laughs> Chase, Chase, I will say, though, I'd put money against almost anyone that's an HTM. He knows his HTM just like he learned the college education all within the last four years. So I'd put him up against anyone. I, I, I think he <laughs> just needs to give himself more credit. But we'll, we'll see what happens, won't we? Let's see. First one. Acronymical soup. <laughs> you know, oddly enough, the idea for the segment of the show was inspired by Samuel Hill from Medigate. Um, I saw a video of him on LinkedIn. He was asking people IT acronyms, which I think are some of just, there's just so many it's monotonous and I kind of feel like it, it kind of spans into the, the biomed realm as well. Um, I recently got my CHTM certification and the amount of acronyms that I had to study, uh, my brain was spinning. Uh, somehow I came out on top, but <laughs> so a couple of them are going to be pretty easy. We'll just get you started. Oh, HTM. Bill. Well, that's easy. Healthcare technology management. Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> TJC. Oh, look at that. You tied it up. It's coming for you. It's DMF. That one's Bill's. Medical Supply. The Center for Medicare Medicaid Services. Or Central Medical Supply. <laughs> you know, see, that's what drives me nuts about acronyms is you'll have, you know, a certain amount of letters and the actual definition of the acronym is way more names See, involved in it. CMS. I didn't hear you would CMMS, think... so I think this was a, that was an unfair question. Okay, well, what's so CMMS? <laughs> it's a database. <laughs> hey, it works for me. <laughs> what, what we say in the Army, as That's long right. as it's in the site, <laughs> site picture? <laughs> yeah, so this is a good point. Here, right? So we have CMMS with two multiple choices. You know, honestly... While this is a game I've tailored, this is more to bring awareness to how much we yes. just all hate acronyms. <laughs> they are Last one for you is NFPA. Oh, that's National Fire Protection something. Protection that's Agency. It. You know what's funny is, money. you were so worried going into this, and you ended up clinching the victory. The <laughs> just Indian barely, though. Button. Yeah. Uh, I'll, 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 give, I'll give Bill a, you know, an, an extra point What's just for, because <laughs> he wasn't technically wrong with CMS. <laughs> All right. So uh, this one is, I, I'm going to tailor this just for Bill because right. obviously he has the biomed background, but um, I would love to get your take on this. Oh, the modality. Yeah, Bill plays the you <laughs> Bill, Bill plays the you <laughs> That's what I was going games. for. All 
Chase, Bill plays the ukulele. And he, could, he could create an original rift for you for any of these segments. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, all all of the the sound segments for the show I've recorded. It's me speaking, and I've just morphed my voice differently. That's one of my little things I like playing with the show. So, oh, the modality is basically where I just ask you, what is a repair or maybe a service that you distinctly remember that maybe gave you PTSD, scarred you, or maybe left you with a laugh? Uh, well, I can remember my, my worst service call that was, I call it the service call from hell, was back when I was in the Coulter days. Uh, it was a Friday. It was, it was my birthday. And I was in a one-man area in Texas, El Paso. And so I had requested the evening off. In a one-man area, you have to do call all the time, you know. So they allowed me to have the evening off. And there's usually no calls, believe it or not, on a, on a weekend out there. But unfortunately, on this one day, there was a call. It happened to be a, a hospital that uh, the unit they wanted me to come work was a backup unit. They were not under service contract, and um, I had to refuse to call. They didn't call me directly. My dispatcher called me, and I had told them that I was had permission to have off for the evening. So the dispatcher called me back again and asked me to go, and, and I told him no because you know I had started. I had a few drinks, and you're not going to drive when you have a few drinks. So long story short, I was supposed to go there the next day on a Saturday. And I usually don't work on Saturdays, but my boss called me up and said I needed to fly out to Phoenix for whatever reason to look at a sale to help the sales lady. So I fly out to Phoenix. I get a call from his boss telling me to fly back to El Paso to go to this hospital and repair the problem. So I get to the hospital. And as soon as I got there, this lab director came out and literally was yelling at me two inches away from my face. I felt like I was in boot camp again. Just yelling, I could see his tonsils of, you know, why he's never going to buy our equipment again and this. So as soon as he was done uh, yelling, I said, all right, is it right if I get to the unit and see what I could do to repair it? It only took me 10 minutes to repair it. It was a thermistor, you know, that caused the power supply to go out. And um, I went in there to tell him I had to repair it, thinking I was going to get an attaboy. <laughs> and he commenced to go right back to my face yelling, but it only took me 10 minutes to repair it. Why couldn't I come last night? <laughs> you know, so... Long story short, that was the worst uh, service call I ever had in history. But what I did different was, is two months later, I went there and I gave my free PM because it needed a PM and I told him not to worry about it. And I left. But before I left, he called me back, told me to call the sales lady. And they ended up buying a Coulter as a primary unit just because I went back and did that PM. So it's funny how things change. But yeah, I, th I think I think as bomb as we got to recognize that sometimes it's not it. I mean, I say it's a lot. It's not about the money. It's, you know, it it kind of it kind of serves you well to let them know that at the end of the day, as a Bob Med, we're there to serve the best interests of the facility and the patient. It's right. it's not it's not about money for the Bob Med. It's it's about the civil service of it. No, and I think right. most people, if not all of our colleagues, would agree that's why we get into the field. But there was a valuable lesson taught. Um, fortunately, Coulter had excellent customer service skill training. Otherwise, I'd have probably wigged out too when he yelled at me. But, uh, you know, I was getting paid for him to yell pretty much. I don't know if his dog died that day or what happened to him. He might have had a bad day. But what I do know is you get paid to be a professional under any circumstance. and You don't lose your cool and you stay professional. And as long as you do that, it pays dividends. You know, you don't get personal about it. And you absolutely have you have to have compassion and say well this person can have a, a, a terrible day you don't know what stressors he or she's going through and you act professional and accordingly and i think if, if everybody was to do that it'd make it a much better world that we live in today so i i cannot top that um i mean i have several stories but i can go on a rant about those all any other time any other hey, episode um, i'm gonna yeah, this is one of those transferable oh, skill set moments. So um, when I became a warrant officer in the Army, they assigned me in my first assignment to um, operate, repair, and maintain a, a, a radar system, something I was wholly unqualified to do, um, and relied on my really wonderful team around me to, to save the day every day. We were at a, a site in Grafenbeer, Germany, in the middle of winter, which is absolutely freezing if anybody's ever been there. And um, in the Army, of course, you have pacing items. And if you got to get to the pacing item, well, then it needs to be operational. 
but it's not operational, it's a problem. So you can relate that to some of our, you know, critical life-saving equipment that we have in hospitals. So same type of concept, that thing needs to always be running. So my radar went down at the same time that my heater in my home went down. And I had to make a difficult choice. And um, we spent about six hours fixing that heater while I was sending excuses every hour. <laughs> <laughs> not working. So yeah, so I guess that's my relatable story. Um, sometimes you got to make the difficult choice, and um, I just wanted to keep the team alive. <laughs> you know, it's so funny with the the technology that we have these days. Just still, how. <laughs> uh, people don't realize that the insulation is not really a thing in Humvees at all. <laughs> If it's cold, you're cold. Right. If it's hot, you're probably going to be hot. And I can under I could definitely sympathize with you. Uh, the motor pull days. While it wouldn't be biomed related, I, I I can imagine an episode coming down the line just someday on this podcast, That's just arm you know army yeah. stories because there's so many of us are, that could just all day long yeah. this you crazy stuff that we've PG had to deal with. And a rated R episode. One for night, one for nighttime. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yeah, biomed after night. Yeah, biomed after night. You never know. <laughs> All right, so I got I got one more game for you, and this one, Bonnie, you'll be able to play too. It's pretty. It's not so much as a game; it's just a question. Uh, let me get the button going. To be or not. To be. So on to be or not to be, simply, I just asked the nerdiest question I can think of as a biomed. Take any medical device that comes to mind. Look, the function of that device. And that is your superpower. Well, you want to take this one first? Yeah, I, I think I would choose some sort of anesthesia machine um, because I would like to be able to just put people to sleep or wake them up when I need to, um, or just administer any sort of medications like at my power. And uh, I would have a lot of fun with that. If I wanted to be entertained, um, you know, I could, I could administer ketamine. Um, if I just needed a break, I could put people to sleep. I think that would be my choice. <laughs> you know, with that power too, you probably would never have a bad night of sleep. Very You'd have a perfect night of sleep every time, which I think when we start getting older, like that just sounds mesmerizing to us. What about you, Bill? I don't know. I guess I'd like to be a database. This way I never forget about any information. I can always have instant recall on whatever I need. That's very highbrow. <laughs> I would have never thought of that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> Your own, you, kind of like your your own CMS or PAC system, just in your mind, but for everything in life. Exactly, I would have all. I'd be like a Google. I'd be like a Google. I'd know you ask me, just ask me. I got the answer for you. The first episode that I aired this segment and I asked the question, <laughs> someone brought up bladder scanner. He's like, I don't think I want to stick with that choice. <laughs> <laughs> okay. and I said, you know, probably the only one that would be worse than a bladder scanner is picking yeah, a neck tube. This, you know, waste uh, management system. <laughs> <laughs> this this goes back to one of my my worst service calls I've gotten is it and David actually put the picture of it that I sent to him in his book. Uh I walked into a surgery center and the Neptune had a sign on it and it said hot and smelly, but they were complaining it was a drain issue. Yeah, that doesn't sound good. You know those big yellow rubber gloves that you wear or see in the old style movies when you wash dishes? I, I wore those. Still didn't. It still didn't help because I still had a nose. Yeah, I, I do have another pretty funny uh, biomed story. I should have made that one instead of this other one. Is I went into this small lab and, and I knew the lab tech. Um, you know, we were actually friends. There was four of them, and it was in a clean room. It was at a wound center, and they spent twelve hours scrubbing this room down, cleaning. And they told me to be very careful in there. I was working on a ZBI that had mercury on it, and the mercury needed to be uh, exchanged and cleaned out. So this is the first time in my, my life I ever put on a space suit. So I'm walking in there, hazmat suit. I'm walking in there just kind of playing around, acting like, you know, 
Star Trek or something. Meanwhile, I'm spilling the, the mercury. I have it on a tube and I'm not paying attention. And all the mercury is going on the floor into a thousand little beads. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I can't cover this up. I got to tell them. But we had a, a mercury spill kit with a, um, a suction device, you know, like um, a syringe. So I'm trying to suck all this mercury off the floor. And I finally, uh, I remember the lady's name, but I won't mention it just for anonymity. Um, so I went ahead and uh, called her and I said, uh, I, I spilled mercury in here. And she thought I was joking. And I said, no, I really did. I'm cleaning it up now. And this lady, even though we were friends, uh, she said she, she hates my guts that day. Clean this up. And then she had to spend another eight hours cleaning that whole place down. So, <laughs> and there is nothing I could do to make it up to her. I mean, we laughed about it, but it took five years. So that was just an embarrassment. Okay, so you're still dad. friends. <laughs> mercury but, ruins uh, relationships. You know how crazy that was back then? They had us carry mercury in the car, and we find out now it's hazardous in heat. You know, the, the vapors from mercury is very hazardous, and the car always had a funny smell in the summertime. So, so back to Little Weird, I blame it on the mercury. <laughs> fair enough man i i loved having you guys on today it's been it's been really awesome and it's one of my bucket list items you know i have i have a long list and i've just been checking them off as i go with each episode so it's been pretty pretty cool and rewarding um i really look forward to you know working with you guys in the future as well um for the people that are watching this and baby you're not a biomed yet and you want to learn more about the field. You want to get further information. Um, I'm going to have information in the description below for to send you straight to these guys so they can get you on the path of the biomed. And, you know, just for those listening, uh, where can they reach out to sure. get the, more information? Um, our about website CBET? is really difficult to remember. www.cbet.edu. Um, if you're interested in uh, imaging education and training, it's uh, www.theimagingacademy.com. Um, and either of those websites are, are active and live, and you get all our information on there, and we'd love, love to hear from you. This is your first challenge to see if you're ready to be a biomed, That's if right. you can remember <laughs> those websites. The first test. <laughs> oh, man. So again, I appreciate you guys being on the show today. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, I appreciate all that you do for the HTM field and, you know, bringing up the next generation for us to, you know, instill our knowledge on and eventually take over for us doing the work day in and day out. So uh, thank you very much for the work Chase. with you guys. And it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Chase. Have a good day, bud. May the beard be with you.